you know, we talk about these big thinkers, right? The ones who challenge everything. We think revolutionaries, activists. Yeah. But a mathematician at the top of his game, giving a lecture at CERN. Really makes you think. That's what's got me so fascinated by this 1972 lecture transcript from Alexander Grothendieck. Right. This is a renowned mathematician. What gets me isn't just who he was, it's where he said all this. CERN. Like the heart of scientific pursuit, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah. And he uses that platform to kind of, I don't know, almost take apart the whole idea of science. Yeah. Why we do it, what it costs us, whether we need a whole different approach. Right. It's important to remember he wasn't just talking in a vacuum. Early no. 70s, it was tense. Cold War, the environment was just becoming this big concern. Right, right. And you feel that in the room as Growth Index starts connecting nuclear research to, well, the fate of humanity. And he's not afraid to just come right out and ask the audience, why are we even doing the science thing anyway? Yeah. He boils it down to two main reasons he saw driving everyone. Yeah. The pure thrill of discovery. The aha moment, right. Exactly. And, and then the more, I guess, practical side. You need a living. Sure. Yeah. On the surface, it's like, yeah, of course, who doesn't want to be intellectually stimulated? And a steady paycheck never hurt anyone, right? Right. But Grothendieck, he picks at that. He talks about the pressure cooker of scientific ambition, the pressure to conform, the toll it takes. Yeah, yeah. Even mentions colleagues, brilliant minds, pushed to tragic ends by the very system that's supposed to celebrate them. It's a heavy thought. For sure. It makes you realize that even in this pursuit of knowledge, there are human costs. Absolutely. Which leads him to dissect that second motivator, the science is a job thing. Yeah. His argument is that somewhere along the line, research got detached from the human needs it should be serving. And that detachment, that's where he sees the danger zone. He uses agriculture as this example Vital to us, obviously. Yeah, live with that. Exactly. But somehow not considered serious science by a lot of researchers. And that disconnect, that's what allows for this duality. Right, like that dual-use research idea he talks about in biology. Yeah. Vaccines that can save lives. Right. But also the potential for bioweapons. Well, Terrifying stuff. Exactly. Same knowledge, two sides of a coin. And for Grothendiggs, this wasn't some abstract worry. This was at the core of his unease. He wasn't anti-science. But the potential for things to go very wrong, especially mm. when we're pursuing knowledge just for the sake of it, without thinking of the consequences. Yeah. That's what worried him. So we've got Growth Endic laying out some pretty serious problems with the way science was and maybe still is being done. But then he brings up this counterexample. Yeah, and it comes out of left field almost. Well, he talks about these barefoot doctors he encountered in China. Barefoot doctors. That's what they were called. And they weren't your typical doctors, not with years of medical school under their belts. They were people from within their communities, often with very little formal education. So like a totally different approach to healthcare. Exactly. And he talks about this one woman, right? She developed this really effective treatment for uterine prolapse but not in some fancy lab through careful observation, experimenting, a real understanding of the body. Hmm. And this story, it really struck a chord with growth energy because it showed him that progress, real progress, it doesn't always need big institutions or fancy degrees. It's about empowering people with knowledge, no matter who they are. Exactly. And that's really at the heart of what growth energy was getting at, that this kind of knowledge it shouldn't be locked away in ivory towers. It should be accessible, used to address real needs in community. Humane, you could say. Absolutely. But even as he's laying this out, he admits that not everyone was on board. He got pushback, even from scientists. Like the whole, well, what about penicillin? Science has saved countless lives. Classic counter-argument, right? And he doesn't disagree. He's not saying all scientific progress is bad, but he uses that example, penicillin, antibiotics, mm -hmm. to get people thinking deeper. Oh, I see. Have antibiotics, in a way, made us weaker. Antibiotic resistance, that's a direct result of overuse. He's not dismissing the good. He just wants us to look at the whole picture, you know, the long game. Right, right. Think about the unintended consequences. Mm. And maybe think about whether a different approach might be more sustainable in the long run. Exactly. Now, he wasn't saying we should abandon science altogether. In fact, he talks about this group he met, the New Alchemists. The New Alchemists. Sounds kind of mystical. It does, doesn't it? But what they were doing was very practical, focused on building sustainable systems, food production, closed loop systems, working directly with farmers, using whatever materials were at hand. So similar to the Barefoot Doctors in a way, taking that knowledge out of the labs and into the real world. Right. 
bridging that gap between research and actual human needs. Solutions can come from anywhere. And sometimes progress means challenging how we think. It's like all these pieces, the critiques, the barefoot doctors, those new alchemists, they fit together somehow. They do, yeah. It all comes back to this need for science that's more grounded, more focused on, well, us, and on making sure that how we use knowledge matters just as much as the knowledge itself. And it's amazing, right, how relevant his worries feel right now. Climate change, AI, gene editing, all those big questions about where science is taking us. It's like he was looking decades into the future, saw these challenges coming, even growth in deck. He didn't have all the answers. Ends the lecture admitting things are uncertain. But that doesn't mean giving up, right? Not at all. He saw it as a starting point, almost. Like if the old way of science, the one he was criticizing, if that was falling apart, well, what could take its place? New ways to work together, share what we know, be responsible with it. So where does that leave us, the people listening? That's what he wants us thinking about, isn't it? Yeah. It's not enough to just see the problems. we got to engage, demand those in charge are transparent, accountable, support the initiatives that feel right to us. It's realizing that shaping the future of science that's on all of us, not just the people in labs. It's about thinking critically, asking the tough questions, making sure knowledge really serves humanity. Absolutely. And maybe that's Growth Indique's biggest impact. He nudged us to imagine a different science, one where human needs, ethics, that interconnectedness of everything, it's a vision that still resonates even now, gives us a kind of roadmap for this crazy world of 21st century science. It's a good reminder. Sometimes the biggest change comes from just asking the question, seeing a new path and getting others to do the same. This deep dive into Growth Endix lecture has given us a lot to think about.